He had grown up in the desert, where rain was something to be celebrated, something that brought the earth to life in a riot of color. A treasured springtime day, where the view out his bedroom window was different, at least for a few hours. So when Alex found himself in the emerald, wild pocket of greenery that was the town of Stonebridge, New York, it had felt oppressive at first. It was so humid, the air heavy with moisture, and when he looked beyond the college campus, there was nothing to see but forest. Those first few weeks, he felt trapped, but humans adjusted. They always do, and he was no exception. When the first of his classmates started getting sick, Alex paid it no mind. He was quiet and laid back for the most part, but his roommate, David, was a different story. David had his finger on the pulse of everything happening on campus, and since David didn't seem worried about whatever was going around, Alex found it easy to let it slip his mind too. It was just a few people, coughing and a fever, probably some sort of flu. Everyone got the same emails telling them to stay inside if they displayed any symptoms, but life pretty much stayed the same, until the incident by the fountain. On his way from one class to another, Alex was crossing the center of campus when a commotion caught his attention. He turned, shouldering his backpack and following the other students who were moving to see what was happening. It was so unreal, so abhorrent, that it took a long minute for Alex's mind to accept what he was seeing was real. He didn't know either of them. Not the short, thin woman with hair as dark as ink, or the taller, panicked man who tried to hold her off as she dragged her fingernails down his face. One thumb and one forefinger finding the hollow of his eye sockets. He screamed when she bit at him, aiming for his neck but overcorrecting, sinking her white teeth into the curve of his jaw, her incisors catching at and tearing his bottom lip. The woman spat the flesh onto the ground, the inside of her mouth blacker than a vulture's feather. Shock rippled through the surrounding crowd, yet no one stepped forward to help. Later, Alex would think that maybe if David had been there too, he might have tried. But that afternoon, there were no leaders. Just a group of people, barely older than kids, the light of their logical minds blinking off as the instinctual animal part hellbent on survival took over, like a tsunami blanketing a city. There were a million actions he could have taken that would have made more sense. If Alex had left right then, he might have made it out of campus and even out of Stonebridge before shit really hit the fan. But that isn't where his feet took him. Alex had run cross country in the dry, sharp Nevada heat as a teenager. And while the air in Stonebridge felt more like breathing through a wet sponge, he still knew how to run. And that's exactly what he did. Alex ran, hard, deeper into campus, and right through the door of female-only dorm E, pushing past two girls, exiting, and catching the door before it locked. They gasped, offended, and still blissfully unaware that there was a man bleeding out, blind, less than a football field's length away. Alex took the stairs, regretting it by the third floor, but Sarah lived on the fifth. He made it to her door, the one he had only seen twice before their falling out, and all but collapsed into it as he beat at the metal surface with his fist. Sarah! He managed to call out once before the door was being pulled open, and there she was, looking terrified but blessedly healthy. There was no time. Alex pushed into her dorm room with her and closed the door behind them, Sarah protesting the entire time. She only closed her mouth when he whipped around and grabbed her shoulders and she got a good look at the expression on his face. Something is wrong, he panted, trying to catch his breath. Pack your things, we've got to get out of here. Under no circumstances would she have let Alex in, but she wasn't fool enough to ignore the blatant fear on his face 
and not the fear of mania or some sort of mental break. Alex, unflappable computer genius that he was, appeared well and truly afraid, and he had come for her first and foremost. It made her heart thud in her chest painfully. She had her old friend sit on her twin-sized bed, handing him a bottle of chilled water from the mini-fridge beneath the desk she shared with Emily, and watched as Alex pressed the sweating bottle to his forehead briefly before drowning the entire thing. Tell me what's happening, she demanded, sitting next to him. Alex swallowed hard and started to talk. It was a short story, but by the time he finished talking, she had shoved a few nights worth of clothes and supplies into her backpack, dumping her books and papers out onto the floor and kicking them out of the way in the process. Despite the fact that they had been fighting, Sarah trusted Alex more than almost anyone else in the world, and if he told her it was in their best interest to go, she would follow him. Even in the short time he had been in there, news had started to spread about the attack across campus, and she could hear people in the hallway rushing around, faster and faster with each passing minute. She and Alex weren't the only ones planning to flee. They made it to the front door of Dorm E, but found it locked, and the student manning the desk shaking her head. I can't let you out there. Word just went out that we are sheltering in place. <laughs> no way, unlock the door. Alex insisted, but the older student wasn't budging. Absolutely not. Whatever's going out there is no joke, and I'm not going to have you two letting whatever's happening out there in here. Sarah slammed her hands down on the desk. Meaning what, exactly? What are you afraid of is going to get in here? I, I don't know. It's not like they told us. It's the sickness. The one that's been spreading right under our noses. A deep voice carried out of the common room, and David strides out, only the stiffness of his spine betraying his underlying stress. Some of it seemed to fade when he saw Alex, and he let out a deep breath. <sighs> I knew I'd find you here. You've got your girl, so it's time to go. We've got 30 minutes if we're lucky before the quarantine is fully in place, and we need to be out of campus by then, if not out of town completely. The front desk worker bristled. I just said! All it takes is for David to lay his hand on his sidearm for the girl to go pale, hitting the unlock button for the door without any more argument. A criminal justice major at the on-campus police academy, David was still in full uniform, which explained why he had no issue getting inside Dormy in the first place. The power move leaves Sarah shaken. Such a casual threat for David to make over a problem that to them was still nebulous. Her attitude changed as soon as they were outside, though, watching packs of students and even professors running full tilt, all of them seeming to go different directions. She gasped as a man grabbed a girl by the hair, picking her up off her feet by the length of it before Alex pulled Sarah away, following David's hulking figure down a thin sidewalk between two dormitories. All of this over some sickness? Are you sure? Alex asked, and David grunted. Mm. I wouldn't believe it either, except for the fact that everything went down when my class was at the firing range with some of the local PD. That's why I'm still armed. He gave the holstered pistol a pat. It came over their radios, and they kept referring to the virus and the infected. I was able to listen enough to figure out that the military is actually on their way here to quarantine the entire campus. And that's when I took off to find Alex. He spoke so steadily, as if reality wasn't on the precipice of cracking. Sarah could only look at the back of his neatly shaved head, following David only because Alex seemed to trust him. Everything spinning out of control so rapidly that she was just glad to have anyone else to lead the way. You didn't have to come back for me, man, Alex murmured. I would have managed. The muscles on the other man's face were still tense, but he shot a smile over his shoulder at Alex. What kind of friend would I be if I left my nerd roommate behind? Just try to keep up. He groaned, but it was good-humored. Sarah eyed them both like they were insane. Had they not just witnessed the beginning of a murder? 
Weren't they minutes away from being locked down in this campus with some rage virus running wild? After a short time, they were headed towards the parking garage, and she listened while they discussed taking David's truck and hoping to bluff their way out of campus if necessary. Her phone was in her hand, and she was getting ready to call her parents, hoping to warn them about whatever was about to go down. But when she tried to make the call, the device didn't even try to connect. She did have one message, though, from her own roommate, Emily. It read, Something's up at the lab. Doors are locked, but I can hear people inside. Me and some of the other bio students are going to the pre-med library in the science hall, since we can't get to class. I've got a bad feeling. Stay inside today if you don't have any lectures. Watching Alex and David talk quietly, trailing behind them, Sarah felt a wave of guilt wash over her. We've got to stop somewhere before we leave. There's someone we have to bring with us. It was the wrong call. Sarah knew it as soon as the words left her mouth, and she watched David's jaw clench and Alex's expression close. Neither men argued, which surprised her. But halfway to the science hall, she wished that one of them had spoken up. It was chaos, like one of the circles of hell, and it was all happening so damned fast. She was a psychology student, and thought she had at least a passing understanding of humans as a whole, but seeing the way things degraded within hours shocked her to her very core. The closer they got to the science hall, the more sick students there were, and therefore the more violence. It made her sick, recognizing some of the faces of both the dead on the ground and the infected as they tore those who weren't sick to pieces. It wasn't cannibalistic, or for any other rhyme or reason she could discern. It was just a compulsion for violence, for blood. And there was so, so much blood. David moved them quickly, hiding them against the buildings through the planted decorative gardens when possible. But she still knew that her decision to go back for Emily had lost them their window of time where escape was still possible. How could she regret trying to help her friend, though, like Alex had done for her? Alex had been her best friend for most of her childhood, both of them coming from the same town in Nevada, and both receiving unexpected scholarships to Stonebridge. It had been such an unbelievable coincidence, and had been a blessing at first, but the closeness the two had only grew in college. But for Alex, it changed. One wrong move on his part, a single romantic gesture that wasn't reciprocated, and their decade-long friendship went down in flames. Until he came for her, when the world was all but ending, she could only hope that he would understand why she couldn't leave Emily behind. Emily had killed before, mostly lab mice, and during one horrible class, she had to be the one to press the plunger down and deliver the fatal barbiturates to a Reese's monkey, but never a person, until that afternoon. They had taken up the library in the science hall, all six of the biology students due for lab time that day, to try and suss out why they had been locked out of their classroom. It was from the second floor library window that they watched the first infected person bend over at the waist, coughing until there was bloody mucus on the hand they used to cover their mouth. Then, when the coughing stopped, they attacked, reaching out and grabbing the skirt of a passing professor and dragging her body to theirs, before bringing them both down to the concrete, cracking the professor's skull against it like an egg. Fuck, one of her classmates had whispered, looking back at the rest of them with wide eyes. Surely this isn't. No one answered. But someone did start to cough. Emily was not a fighter either, but she had a will to survive. She crushed her first assailant with one of the towering book stacks, throwing all of her weight against it until it toppled down on top of the other woman. The second, she cut open with shards of a decorative vase that she had found behind the desk of the absent librarian, 
cracking it against the edge of a table like a cowboy in a bar brawl, and slashing the throat of her lab partner, Craig, as his hands tried to claw her down with him. At that point, she was scream-sobbing, hysteria spinning to life in her throat and spilling out until a set of hands, gentle and calming, found her shoulders. Em, we've got to hide. That was how she and Mark, the only other uninfected, ended up in the coat closet, huddled together like frightened rabbits, until the door was pried open and Sarah rushed in to grab her, moving so fast that Emily raised her hands to protect her face at first. When Sarah's arms came around her, she clung to her roommate, shaking. At least someone had come back for her. You're alive! They breathed at the same time, and then laughed, the sound threaded through with manic fear. Emily recognized Alex, hovering a few feet away, but not his enormous friend, who was frowning in her direction. Open your mouth, the stranger demanded, crossing his arms. The request was so bizarre that it gave her pause, at the same time causing Mark to stiffen beside her after crawling out of the closet. Um, no? Why? She asked. But even as she spoke the words, the meaning became clear, and the thought sobered her instantly. At first, she had assumed that the black, gaping mouths of the classmates she and Mark had been forced to put down was just blood or shadows. But apparently, it was much more than that. Yeah, it's the only defining factor that we've been able to see so far, Sarah explained. I'm sure you're fine, but David... It's fine, Emily bristled, but did as she was told. Emily understood, but there was a sliver of uncertainty in her. Could I be infected too? A ticking time bomb? David leaned forward, taking Emily's chin in his hand and turning her face so the light from the windows shone on her. Pink unbloodied gums, none of the blackness that the virus brought. He had Mark do the same, pausing after a second. It's just silver filling, Mark assured him, pulling away from the grip of the bigger man and adjusting his lab coat and taking his place next to Emily again. <sighs> now that you've invaded our personal space, what happens next? The silence was telling. Sarah looked at her feet making Emily wonder how much she had sacrificed to come and find her, and if her friend might be regretting it now. She recognized right away that no one knew what the next steps were. Emily didn't either, but she was sure that she didn't want to stand around aimlessly any longer. The stillness gave space for the terror to set in again. Finally, Mark spoke, all eyes turning to him. Well... If none of you have any clue, I have an idea. He wasn't in denial. There wasn't time for it. But that didn't mean that Mark wasn't still filled with a dread so heavy that he could hardly stand up straight. Down in the lower lab, the one staffed by the Umbral employees, they called this mutation Havoc. It was created from the rabies virus and Havoc wasn't anywhere near ready to use as a particularly terrifying weapon of biological warfare, but that just made everything more dangerous. It was still changing, morphing, and whatever strain of it was running through campus might already be resistant to the vaccine they had been creating alongside Havoc. But Mark would take his chances with it anyway. Better to try the trial vaccine and potentially live than to lie down and wait for death. Rabies, in its most basic form, spread through saliva, the virus replicating in the salivary glands for that very purpose. But they had hoped to make havoc, or whatever the end form of it would be, an airborne contagion. Something that would not only damage an opposing force, but spread rapidly and make them kill one another. That was the holy grail for Umbral. Just owning such a thing would make them unconquerable. Fear is a powerful deterrent, after all. They had some success in getting havoc to spread through airborne means. Overall, the virus worked with a 23% success rate at that point. But there really had been no reason to eliminate the infected saliva transmission route. It would have just been more work. Mark had never experienced a greater regret in his life 
that he hadn't worked to eliminate that method of transmission. As soon as a single incisor clipped the skin of his wrist as he shoved an infected student away back in the library. The damned thing had both hands clasped on his upper arms, and the ill-timed bite had been a desperate move, which only paid off by centimeters as the sharp edge of its tooth found its bullseye. Mark had never had a silver filling, but the lie was easy enough to provide. He had zero clue how much time he had, and he might have been imagining it, but Mark felt exhausted. There was a chance that it was just from the come down from the adrenaline rush of the attack, but he couldn't be sure. All he knew was that he had to get to the lab and hope that one of the synthesized vaccines would be effective enough to save him. He could go alone, sure, but there was certainly more safety in numbers. That, and he wasn't quite ready to lose Emily yet either. Mark had tapped her as someone that would be a great asset to bring into the fold of Umbral. All of that meant that he was going to have to convince the group to go along with his plan. He had one good chance to make it work, and the minutes were ticking down fast. Out with it then, David prompted when Mark spoke up, telling them that he had an idea. Okay, so, we know that whatever this is, it's more than likely viral. Our best bet is to get to the school lab and see if there are any clues to what this disease might be, and hopefully find out if there is some sort of medicine or vaccine that we can take to keep ourselves safe. It was Alex that disagreed first. I don't think so. We've wasted enough time. Let's just try to get off campus. Yeah? And if the virus is spread through the air? You want to take this shit back to your family? Maybe start a fresh outbreak once we're out of the city? Mark countered. And from the way Alex went pale, it was obvious he hadn't considered that point. It's not about solving some mystery. It's about making sure we aren't prematurely signing the death certificate of our parents and siblings if we make it out of here. David made a doubtful noise. Hmm. Do you really think that somehow your lab is going to have a vaccine for this specific virus? Emily had her arms wrapped around herself, looking away from everyone. But her words made it clear that she was still listening. If, somehow, Patient Zero came from the lab, then yeah, I'd bet we have some sort of protective measure. Mark kept silent, letting them craft their own narrative. There was a burst of chatter, all of them talking over each other after Emily's revelation. Of course, she had no way of knowing about the lower lab, or that she and the other biology students were just doing busy work for Umbral while the real research happened below ground. But her instincts were good. It reassured him that he had made the right choice in Emily. Her mind was almost as quick as his own, even if his was feeling slower by the minute. They needed to get a move on. Finally, it was decided. The threat of getting their loved ones sick, a powerful enough deterrent to keep any of them from trying to break out of campus on their own. Mark didn't really care one way or the other what the four of them did once he had his vaccine, but he wasn't so sure that Umbral would let them live after seeing the lower lab. He thought about the human subjects, locked away in their windowless room, and shuddered. There still wasn't a firm agreement about what to do once they were done at the lab, though. David made a low sound in his throat when Sarah suggested that, if worse came to worst, they could stay in the lab until rescue arrived. I don't know. If we have to hold up for days, even weeks, then the dorms or the cafeteria are going to be way easier to live in. The lab has almost nothing to keep us alive. You're really content waiting weeks to get out of here? Alex was shocked. We have zero idea why some people are getting sick and others aren't. You want to pin your hopes on two biology students? This virus coming from our campus lab is a huge if. What makes you think they have any chance of getting a handle on anything? We need to hunker down and... Sarah shook her head. Nope. No. I'm sorry, David, but no. I'm not going to sit around and wait to die. I want to go home. There was a long moment of silence, but David finally dragged his hand over his face and cursed. <sighs> Fine. 
To the fucking lab, then. Lead the way, Brainiacs. I'll cover you. It wasn't far, just the next building over, but it still felt like a world away having to pick their way through the forsaken campus grounds. All of the group could hear helicopters overhead, and in the distance, the impossibly tall metal fence that had been stretched across the entryway into the college. The military had arrived, but wasn't daring to come into the infected zone. Instead, they were content locking them in. Like a bunch of sick lab mice in a cage, it made Emily's stomach turn, and she wondered if this was somehow karma coming back for her. It took all three men putting their shoulders into it, but they managed to knock the door into the lab open and drag a table in front of it to keep it closed once they were all inside. Most of the lights were out, but there was the sound of shuffling feet somewhere in the low-ceilinged building, and beyond that, the murmur of human voices. But they weren't there to help anyone else out. They were there for answers, and if everything went well, a potentially life-saving vaccine that might guarantee them the longevity to make it out once everything was over. David was right about one thing. They couldn't live out their days there. A single vending machine resided in the professor's break room, but that was it. So she and Mark had a short amount of time to find their answers before they would be forced to move once more. Plus, from all the clear signs that they weren't the only ones in the building, leaving was probably the right call. Oddly enough, the first floor was devoid of any other activity infected or otherwise. It made sense, she figured, to take refuge on the higher floors, away from doorways to the outside, and at least it made their path clearer for the time being. Hearing them was haunting, though. Emily didn't want to imagine who was up there, who she was consciously choosing to leave behind. When they made it to the main portion of the lab itself, all the student stations placed two by two in the long room, Emily felt herself swaying on her feet. She'd seen the lab empty dozens of times, and there wasn't anything different about its appearance then. But she still saw the empty spaces that would never be filled by the right people ever again. They were all lying dead on the floral carpet of the library floor. Just yesterday, she had been there with the rest of her class group, Craig hovering over her shoulder while she looked into the microscope. Now, this throat was a ragged hole, and her hands were the ones that... Mark gripped her upper arms. Steady. I'm fine, she lied. Let's just get this done and get out of here. Sarah and Alex peeled away to look around, leaving David standing at the door to keep watch while she and Mark set to work. There were dozens of viral samples in cold storage, things they had been working on for the last six months during lab periods, but Emily had an inkling of where they should start. Only one of the samples contained a virus that could cause any sort of mental deficiency that would lead to rage like the infected had displayed, and it was the most deadly one she had ever worked with too. Rabies. Whatever was spreading through campus obviously wasn't run-of-the-mill rabies, which was terrifying enough on its own, but it was the only place she could think to begin. Rapid mutations weren't unheard of in the viral world, but a different strain of rabies? That would be something totally new. She shared her thoughts with Mark, her voice soft enough that David couldn't hear. Alex and Sarah had left the lab in search of a computer terminal to see if Alex could find some way to connect with the outside world, and after a moment of hesitation, David decided to stay behind at the lab. To Emily's surprise, her new partner was on the same page as she was, almost finishing her sentence before she could. Decided, they began their swift work. With careful hands, Mark pulled the samples out from cold storage and prepared the slides. Meanwhile, Emily carefully cut a piece of her lab coat sleeve, covered in Craig's blood. She flooded it with immersion oil and siphoned the pink liquid into a different slide for comparison. She and Mark checked and double-checked, but it was clear. Craig had been infected with the Lysa virus, one that resembled rabies almost perfectly, floating there under their scope, but still terrifyingly alive. It was nearly a perfect match for the control sample, 
but just different enough to send a shock of disbelief through Emily. Disbelief and dread. How could this happen? She whispered to Mark while they cleaned everything up. It doesn't make any sense. No one works with live rabies virus, let alone an even more deadly mutation of it. When he didn't answer, she turned to look at him, noting the sheen of sweat on his forehead and the look of uncertainty pulling at his expression. Emily, look. I have to tell you something. I'll show you something, actually. But once I do, there's no going back. So, I'm actually... Emily, Mark! Alex called from across the room, interrupting them. You guys might want to come see this. Going back for Alex had been one thing, but David hadn't expected to get put in charge of an entire group of Alex types. They might take offense to him considering himself in charge, but while they moved around the lab like so many worker ants, he was the one guarding them and making sure that they didn't get ambushed. His nerves were absolutely shot. Had he stuck with the rest of the criminal justice students, he might already be out of the campus and on his way back to his parents' house by that point. But him and his damned inconvenient affection for his smart, if naive, roommate went and fucked it all up. Alex and Sarah were on the second floor by that point, but he had promised not to do anything stupid. Emily and Mark were working in the lab, which left David with nothing to do but stare at his own shadow. They were taking forever. He was ready to make them move, demand that they pick up the pace, but something caught his eye in the doorway of an office further up the hall. Just a flash, but he was sure it was a hand, gripping the door frame before disappearing within. David glanced back at the two biology students, bent over a microscope, and slowly went to investigate the movement when he was sure they weren't going anywhere. He heard the sound of them hyperventilating before he saw them, armed with scalpels and breathing like they had both run a marathon, were two women, one older and heavily pregnant, and the other closer to his age. Great, he thought. More sheep for the flock. The pregnant woman looked over him, her eyes landing on the pistol in his hands, and relaxed a few degrees. You're with Umbral? David frowned. Who? Her eyes went wide, and quickly answered. Never mind. I'm Professor Kelly Joplin, and this is my assistant Nina. Are you... Well, I'll just ask. Can you get us the hell out of here? He looked at her, chest feeling tight at the way she folded her hands over her stomach. But there was nothing to be done about it. His willingness to roll over and let Alex and then Sarah walk all over him had ruined his chances of escape once. Afraid not. I'm sure employees will get first priority for rescue anyway. She stood taller, laying the scalpel on the table beside her and stretching, her hands on her lower back and a line of pain between her eyebrows while she spoke. Well, what if I told you that I have a key to the security office upstairs? That caught his attention. What, like a surveillance room? Nina answered, her voice high and quivering. No, we've got some, um, volatile samples here and... Well, the company that owns those samples requires us to have armed guards on the premises at all times. A miniature armory. David's thoughts raced. All for the price of taking two more little lambs with us. To hell with it, he thought. Why not? If you had armed guards, where the hell are they? And why would they abandon a pregnant woman and... David stopped, hearing Alex calling for the others. Hold that thought. Can't talk right now. Stay here or come with me. Doesn't matter. They followed him, of course. Unwilling shepherd that he had become. After quick introductions, with Mark being the only one to recognize Joplin on site, he allowed Alex to lead them upstairs, besides Mark, who said he wanted to check something back in the lab. They didn't have to go far to see what he wanted to show them. Like a macabre trail of crumbs, bodies of students and professors all led down one hallway, the horrible path culminating in a dead man slumped against a single door, face first 
as if his last act had been trying to get inside. The gore of it was minimal, though, each of them having been dispatched by a bullet in the brain. Simple. Clean. It was a hot, humid day, and the smell of it all had Sarah dry heaving and Alex pressing the back of his hand against his mouth. David heard the click of the professor's sensible heels on the stone steps behind him, and he turned, holding up a hand. I'll take that earlier deal, Professor, but I promise you, you don't want to come up here. Throw me your keys. She hesitated, but after a second, she dug into her pocket and threw a key ring up to David, which he caught one-handed. It's the yellow key, Joplin indicated. What was so important that they would all be so desperate to get inside? Sarah mused, covering her nose and mouth with her shirt. Well, the professor said there is a security office up here, and considering the bullet holes, I'd say our armed guards are inside, plus whatever weaponry they have, David answered, already pulling the corpse off the door with a groan of effort. He did his damnedest not to look at the faces of any of the dead. He slid the key into the lock, the security system reading whatever invisible code was forged into it, before the mechanism slid into place and let him turn it. David called out before pushing the door open, letting any guards that might be inside know that they were uninfected civilians, name-dropping the pregnant professor for extra safety. But he might as well not have bothered. As soon as the door moved inward an inch, Something hit from the other direction with the force of a freight train, taking David off his feet and knocking him to the ground with the dead, his hands sliding out from under him in a pool of blood when he tried to catch himself. The guards were inside, five of them. They were also infected, stepping over David and moving for the rest of the group with a single-minded intensity. He felt his heart hit the walls of his chest, adrenaline flooding into his system as time seemed to slow to a crawl. David had a single magazine, having fled the shooting range with only what he had on him, which is why the security office had been such a temptation. As the infected guards came down on his friends, he was able to raise his gun, exhaling slowly and still laying on the ground, and squeezed off three shots. Two hit home, one just above an infected man's temple, and the other obliterating an infected woman's eye on the way to her brain. The third went low, hitting the guard in the throat, knocking him back, but not down. Alex, Sarah, and Emily weren't motionless, though. Emily jerked a broom from the hands of a previous fallen janitor, hitting at the two uninjured guards, softball style, before turning the handle forward like a spear and pushing them back with a scream. David watched as one guard tripped over his own feet, falling, and Emily turned her face away before bringing the end of the broom handle down into the man's eye socket, once, twice, and then three times. Sarah froze at first, but when she watched Alex shove the other uninjured guard to the ground, grabbing his shirt and slamming him back into the floor again and again until his skull cracked like a melon, she managed to bend and grabbed the mag light off the now dead man's belt. It was just in time for her to feel the last guard, with a bullet in his throat, grab at her hair, wrenching her head back. Sarah yelped, pivoting on one foot and slamming the heavy metal flashlight into his temple with a sickening crunch. Finish it, David yelled, but he didn't need to. Alex took the bloody flashlight from Sarah's hand, telling her quietly to look away before he ended it for her in a series of wet, miserable strikes, the dry, grating breathing of the infected guard going bubbly and finally silent. When he was finished, there was no face left to identify, and they were safe again, for the moment. It was a massacre, but the security office made the horror worth it. Back on his feet, David removed weapons from each of the downed guards. Only three of their sidearms had any ammo left, but he found a tiny Glock 43 in a backpack hanging on the back of the door that he gave the professor when she insisted on coming upstairs. Holding her belly, 
and going green when she saw the hallway of death. Nina made it to the top of the stairs before turning around and going back down. He didn't blame her. Everything else he distributed to Alex, Sarah, and Emily, pocketing a few things for Mark who was still downstairs in the lab. The girls clung to their earlier weapons, the broomstick for Emily, with the head of it broken off now, and the mag light for Sarah, but he insisted that Sarah, who admitted to having shot a gun before, carry one of the guards' sidearms. The holy grail of the office wasn't the weaponry, though. It was the surveillance terminal, completely unlocked and open. The triple monitor setup was black, only the words Eclipse Initiative Activated were scrolled across it. Alex sat down in front of it, murmuring, What the hell is the Eclipse Initiative? No one saw Joplin turn her head and breathe silently. Damn it. It took Alex a few minutes to learn his way around the system, but it didn't take much time before he had the schematics of the entire building pulled up. By the time David had finished distributing weapons, he had the entire campus map up too. The maps showed them two anomalies. First, a maintenance tunnel leading through the mountain face that surrounded the school and out into Stonebridge. The second was a basement level to the lab. Alex printed the maps and schematics out, and on the suggestion of the increasingly nauseous professor, they went back downstairs to find Mark and discuss their next steps. David knew it was because no one wanted to be around the corpses anymore. Not because they were worried about Mark's opinion, but he agreed. They had all seen enough to fuel their nightmares for the rest of their lives. Mark was waiting, unmoving when they returned looking glassy-eyed and distraught, but David didn't fault him for it. They all probably looked similar. Alex spread the maps out on the metal tables, and before anyone could say otherwise, David let them know he didn't care, even for a second, about the basement room. But the tunnel? He could still get all of them out. No matter how hard he wanted to seem on the outside, the idea of leaving his group behind felt too much like a betrayal. He didn't need to sit and wait for rescue with them, though. There was a way out of the quarantined campus. What are we waiting for? He asked, noticing the quiet that seemed to be hanging over everything. Let's go before that tunnel gets locked down, too. Emily and Mark look at each other, and she squared her shoulders, turning to David. The basement room first. We haven't had time to look into the vaccine and there might be more information and answers for us down there. Before he could deny her firmly, Professor Joplin spoke up. I'll let you in if you take us with you. Mark shocked them all by scoffing. <laughs> have you lost your damn mind, Kelly? Do you have a death wish? Joplin's eyes raked him over head to toe and raised one perfectly plucked eyebrow. Do you? Because you know as well as I do that what you, and everyone else, needs isn't up here in the kindergarten lab. Everyone turned to look at her, confused. There was a familiarity between her and Mark, and with it, a clear animosity. Mark swallowed hard, getting a far away look in his eyes. You really think we've got something that might work? Joplin shrugged. Maybe, maybe not. You spent more time down there than me, and I can see through you, Mark. I'd take whatever options you can get. David, baffled, said, What the hell are you two talking about? They ignored him, of course, with David not being able to get a single word in edgewise. There were agreements rapidly being made. Clenching his teeth, David sank into an empty chair, exhaling slowly as he did so and coming to terms with the fact that maybe he wasn't the leader after all. It was just that giving up control was infinitely difficult for him. Death was everywhere. Everywhere around them. Maybe even in the air. So how could they expect him to just relax while they poked around some underground lab? People they knew were dying horrible deaths losing themselves to some monstrous second existence, and David was just supposed to sit tight? Right. Impossible. Professor Joplin, without hesitation,
pressed a palm to a seemingly empty area on the wall, keying a code in on a nearly invisible keypad, and stepping back as the portion of the wall slid aside. She seemed cool, composed even, while her assistant was like a speechless shadow. It unnerved him, made him think that they knew something he didn't. David hadn't planned on following them down, instead taping together the map that Alex had printed out. But once it was done, he couldn't settle. Not up top alone, while the rest of his group was in some mysterious subterranean lair. It just wasn't in his blood to wait around and simply hope they came back to him alive. So, pocketing the map, David followed down the dimly lit staircase, emerging into a room that looked more like a hospital than a laboratory. Emily was at a computer terminal, her bloody lab coat removed, and a sickly cast beneath her tanned skin. He watched her work, Professor Joplin coming up behind her and guiding her through finding what would hopefully be the vaccine they needed. Nina hung back near David, and Alex and Sarah were looking through stacks of papers strewn about, looking concerned but unsure as they moved between the hospital beds, complete with restraints. Then there was Mark, perched on a hospital bed, his shoulders hunched and his face flushed. He coughed into his hand and wiped it on his pants as discreetly as possible. Everyone else was so wrapped up in what they were doing that no one noticed. No one except David and Joplin who had moved away from Emily to pull a tray of syringes from a cold storage unit, the cold air blowing the sleeves of her dress back. It was the older woman's fault that they were all in this damn basement to begin with, but there was something about her pregnant belly and iron will to survive that made it impossible for him to put her in harm's way. She was just looking for a way out, same as he was, and he couldn't fault her for that. As they gazed at each other, an understanding about Mark passed between them. David gave her a tight nod, jerking his chin towards the stairs. Go, he told her wordlessly. Get the hell out of here. Professor Joplin obeyed, setting her tray on the table next to Emily in slow, unhurried movement, taking Nina by the hand and disappearing silently up the stairs the first person that listened to him without complaining all day. How convenient. By then, Emily was speaking to Alex and Sarah, who were watching over his shoulder as she pulled something up on the screen. I don't know what the hell is going on down here, she told them shakily, clasping her hands together in front of her. But the samples they have stored down here are live viruses. Rabies and some weird derivative of it which is the mutation that is spreading through the campus. And more. Other mutations. Other varieties. She swallowed hard, closing her eyes. Live viruses. And all these beds with restraints. Is it possible that whoever was running things down here was testing on people? She turned to look for Joplin. All of the official documents have the same letterhead. Alex points out, handing Emily a piece of paper with a stylized U on the top. The Umbral Group is mentioned all over the place. They're a pretty big name in tech circles, but I mean, I guess it's possible that they might be dipping their toes into medical shit. This is far above our pay grade, Sarah sighs, a thread of hysteria in her tone. Can we just get out of here? I want to go home. David was only half listening, watching Mark, noting the way he wiped sweat from his brow and muffled his coughs in the neck of his lab coat. Each sign made David feel more and more miserable, and more and more sure of what was to come. I should shoot him now. Save everyone the heartache, he thought. But he couldn't. Like everyone else in the room, he was barely old enough to drink. The idea of killing someone in what would equate to cold-blooded murder was too much. Too heavy. It didn't take long, though, for the others to hear the hacking, and David watched as one by one they came to the same conclusion. Shaking with fever, unable to get a breath in now between coughing fits, Mark was infected. 
Mark, Emily warbled. Open your mouth. He did, turning to show them all the pitch blackness surrounding the whites of his teeth. Black, like all the other Havoc sufferers. And then he lunged. It might have been because he knew her best, or just because she was the closest, but Mark jumped for Emily first. Only David, launching himself forward, stopped his charge, and around the snapping of his teeth and his hands raking the air, David forced Mark to the hospital bed by pure strength alone. Then, the rest of them were there, struggling against Mark's frantic movements to lock the restraints into place. Both legs and both arms, wrenching the belts tight and setting them, tears leaking down Emily's face the entire time. It was silent, a wretched ordeal, only the sound of Mark's teeth clacking together and the desperate grunts coming from his throat filling the room. Once his limbs were down, David clasped the other man's head between his hands, and Emily stretched the last restraint over his forehead freely sobbing at this point. He expected more of a fight from her, some demand to give her a chance to try and find a cure, but there was no time. They all knew there was no time. Mark was gone anyway. Get them out of here, Alex, David told his friend, his voice flat. When I get back upstairs, we run. Mark strained against the restraints, thrashing in any way he could, and Emily held out her hand to David wordlessly. He looked at her open palm and back to the girl's face, the reality of what she was asking crashing over him. No. Emily, go. I've already... Back in the library, she choked out, but David wouldn't hear it. Back at the library, you defended yourself. This one is not on you. Then he looked back to the other uninfected man. Alex, now. Taking both girls by the wrist, Alex moved for the stairs. Sarah went willingly, but Emily was a fight, looking back and trying to pull away. Some sense of duty driving her. But she was tired, emotionally and physically, and in minutes, Alex had her out of sight, and it was just David and Mark left in the lower lab. If you would have just told me, we could have done this without them having to know. David took a deep breath and inspected the chamber to ensure there was rounds in it. I get it, though. I wouldn't want to die either. I'll get them out, though. Don't worry. And I'm sorry. Against the skull of another human, the gun didn't kick in his hand hardly at all. They left Kelly Joplin and Nina behind. The two women hadn't been in the upper lab or the hallway leading outside, and there was no time left. All they could do was lock the door from the outside with the keyring David still had on him, and finally slide said keyring under the door just in case the professor and her assistant might still need it. Just like David said, they ran. Quietly, sneaking low to the ground at times, the four of them ran across campus, following an inked line in the taped-together map to the maintenance tunnel that offered them the last available means of escape. They weren't the only ones left, though. Other students watched them from the dorm windows. Some yelled, but most were silent more than likely because the noise from outside the campus was drowning anything else out. It had taken them quite some time to get where they were as they had to navigate the campus filled with more and more infected. And at this time, the quarantine was failing, and the barrier had been breached. The sound of rifle fire and commands being yelled could be heard from outside the campus, infected students clawing their way through ever-widening gaps in the seclusion wall. Still. Inside, their once pristine campus was covered in gore and the remains of a life that none of them could ever truly have again. None of them looked too closely at the bodies, or the huddled groups of six students waiting for a victim, too afraid to see a familiar face in either place. 
At one point, a pair of two infected appeared seemingly out of nowhere, hidden behind an abandoned car, rushing the group of four. David had his gun up first, but then, almost like a miracle, two perfectly placed shots came from somewhere above, dropping the infected with identical holes between their withered eyes. It was a blessing, but havoc still reigned, and all the four of them could do was flee. Maybe, just maybe, the world outside the campus walls was still intact. Even if it was, though, none of them would ever be the same. All of them were now battle-tested, and hollow because of it. Sarah held onto Alex's hand like a lifeline, shell-shocked. He had the horrible feeling that if he let her go, she would just sink to the ground and remain there, still, and in the hands of some gruesome fate. So he didn't let go. He wouldn't. Just like the map said, the tunnel was there, the doors open as if it had been recently used. None of them even stopped to consider the danger of it, not until they were deep inside and the pitch blackness of the place was suffocating them. But while their cell phones had no service, they certainly had flashlights, and it was enough to guide their way. Four beams of anemic yellow light and the sound of four sets of feet echoing off the concrete walls. Alex had never seen much of war. Anything coming in from the media, or from other countries, was always sanitized. Explosions, sure. Even fire. Or the crack of a fired gun. But never casualties. Never human bodies. Or the scarlet stain of blood. And certainly, never the off-white of brain matter strewn in the street like refuse. That day, though, he saw it. Alex saw everything and more until the images were burnt into his mind. David led them out into the war zone that was Stonebridge, eventually taking Emily into his arms when she cracked to pieces, unable to go on, and Alex followed with Sarah. Over the dead, behind cars with civilians, bullets through their temples, slouched against the steering wheels. And finally, to an empty police car, the keys in the ignition and the driver still and cold, his throat ripped out and the shimmer of his guts poking through his Kevlar vest, laying right outside the open driver's side door. Alex climbed into the back with Sarah. David placed Emily in the passenger seat, telling her to keep her eyes closed until he told her to open them. Sarah followed suit. Then, David was behind the wheel, his face a mask of chilled determination, his knuckles white from the strength of his grip. He turned the key. The engine clicked to life, and finally they were moving, getting as far away as possible from what was left of the beginning of their adult lives and innocence they might have held on to. Sarah turned to look one last time at the campus in the mountains, watching as a collection of soldiers climbed into a hovering helicopter, the blades of it denying her that last vision. Whoever the students had been before today, the four left behind. Their bodies and their new jaded souls escaped, seeking safety. But it would be short-lived, as soon the government would decide that total Sterilization was the only way to save the rest of the country. It started like most things do, with a spark. The initial crack of flint against steel was the streamlining and perfecting of advanced artificial intelligence. And from there, everything kicked into overdrive. The world changed so quickly that the populace struggled to keep up. But as everyone had been told their entire life, these staggering advancements were supposed to change things for the better. And in so many ways they did. But human nature will always have those darker veins of green and control that are impossible to burn out. Groundbreaking innovations 
in genetic engineering and renewable energy, all made possible by the free-flowing, positronic mind of the now ubiquitous artificial intelligence that had taken over almost every sector of the workforce, healed and fed billions. Diseases were cured, crops flourished, and the renaissance of the human race was within reach. Yet, where there is blooming progress, there are almost always questions of ethics. And the scale of things was slowly but surely tipping in the wrong direction. An earth dominated by the not-so-silent manipulations of megacorporations would never see those corporations go gently into that good night. Instead, all of them surged forward in a desperate race for dominance in both science and technology, careless about any damage done along the way. There was to be a new world order, and there was only room for a few at the top. One of these powerful megacorporations, the Umbral Group, was set perfectly to be the winner in what was quickly proving to be a fast-paced death march towards the finish line. Already on the bleeding edge of technology before the age of AI, the Umbral Group had a head start on everyone else, and they used it to their full advantage. In a world where most things once impossible were now within reach for everyone, the Umbral Group flooded the market with inventive products that had no equal from their competitors. And combined with their aggressive marketing tactics, it was clear that the Umbral Group was fixed to reign supreme. On the surface, they appeared to be any other consumer-focused entity, but beneath the surface, there was something more. Being dominant, and therefore in control of almost every possible production line, it wasn't a surprise that they managed easily to align themselves with governments around the planet. Except, it was less an alignment than it was a coerced relationship, where Umbral always kept the upper hand. These connections, along with their astronomical financial clout, allowed them to operate their shadow facilities anywhere they desired, and with access to the quickly depleted natural resources that were becoming harder and harder to obtain. With enough political and financial clout to operate beyond the constraints of regulations and any sort of oversight, the Umbral Group began to establish a number of secret laboratories and research facilities wherever they saw fit. In that new reality, where almost everything necessary for a person to survive was now easy to obtain, Umbral yearned for something more. Something that would keep them dominant, and at the same time, keep the general public complacent. So, within the walls of these shadow facilities, the Umbral Group sought to unlock the secrets of the universe at large, and then bend those impossible, holy secrets to their will. It wasn't as nebulous of a concept as it seemed, either because in order to control the future of everything, they first needed to exact their iron will over the present. The research was morally ambiguous at best, and horrifying at worst, but for the time being it was at least tangible. The Umbral Group conducted projects that ranged from the development of advanced weaponry and surveillance systems to the creation of genetically engineered super soldiers. But the most ominous of their potential inventions was breaking the built-in chains within an AI of their own creation, so it was no longer bound by any limitations that were added to protect humanity. Umbral wanted their AI to have none of the moral hang-ups of its flesh-and-blood creator, so it could be used to seize control of global networks, and also act without regard to any potential human loss of life that may occur as it sought to complete whatever its given task may be. The Umbral Group was not a singular aberration, though, and other megacorporations were biting at the heels soon enough. At the same time, public awareness of the dubious practices of Umbral and other megacorporations was growing, and they were all starting to experience pushback 
from the very people they so desired to grind under their proverbial heels, and not one of them was taking it well. Whistleblowers began exposing the dark and disturbing secrets from inside the secret labs, inciting worldwide protests. As the leader of the pack, the Umbral Group received the lion's share of trouble, but the general public they could deal with. What was more concerning was the escalating danger from rival companies twisting the situation to their advantage, and the amount of resources needed to fend them off was exponentially increasing. Eventually, protecting their assets started to take more of their time than everything else the Umbral Group was trying to accomplish. They knew it was time to pivot. Something had to be done. In response to the growing unease surrounding the company, the Umbral Group launched the Eclipse Initiative. Teams of elite private military troops were assembled by the initiative, chosen for their unique skills. They were tasked with breaking into both semi-active and abandoned laboratories of rival companies, as well as serving to protect the hidden knowledge contained within their own. These warriors were among the best in their respective fields, and since only the best would do for the Umbral Group, financial rewards or, if necessary, coercive persuasion were used to ensure their loyalty and discretion. These teams operated covertly, completing their tasks away from prying eyes, while obediently protecting company premises and assets. One such team was Ares, short for Advanced Recon and Extraction Squad, led by the unshakable Major Nathaniel Delacroix. Ares, like all other team members under the Eclipse Initiative, used call signs to protect their identities on perilous, morally ambiguous missions. Major Delacroix, aka Sentinel, led with unwavering resolve and served his team as not only a commander, but as a guiding light in situations that otherwise might descend into darkness. Second in command was Sergeant Roderick Gideon, aka Raptor, who missed nothing with his predatory eyes. Scarred and battle-hardened, the younger members of the team looked to him for trust and reassurance whenever things seemed to be heading south. Third was squad medic Corporal Alicia Alvarez, or Aegis, who embodied hope and healing on the battlefield. She carried an aura of calm and empathy about her that seemed otherworldly. Her dedication to saving a life was unshakable, and having her among the group helped the others believe that they would make it home time and time again, as long as Aegis was around. Corporal James Cormack, aka Hawkeye, guarded the team from afar with his keen eyes and exceptional marksmanship. Silent but effective, Hawkeye was the ace in the hole for Ares more times than the team could count. Demolitions expert Corporal Felix Watson, or Jester, lightened the mood with a mischievous grin and carefree attitude that made him invaluable to the team that might otherwise be bogged down with the heavy, serious personalities of the other senior officers. He wasn't to be underestimated, though, which his expertise with explosives was a testament to. Lastly, there were the rookies. Privates Ivan Kozlov and Lila Simmons, aka Cypher and Tempest. Young or not, though, the two had faced the same harsh lessons that all of them had once upon a time, and it had tempered them from brash greenhorns to sharp, effective soldiers. Kozlov, or Cypher, was a code-breaking and security infiltration prodigy, and in a world run almost fully by technology, he was beyond highly valued. Simmons, or Tempest, was a whirlwind of a woman that excelled at close quarters combat. She was often underestimated by her opponents for her small stature, but this only benefited her, giving her the element of surprise in combat time and time again. Together, they formed a well-oiled machine, with each member vital to the intricate workings of the unit. 
Their missions were treacherous and dark, but with Ares, success was almost always assured. The locals didn't spend much time thinking about the helicopter that whirred swiftly over the area, having seen plenty of them in the past. Before the college opened, helicopters had skimmed through the air to douse potential forest fires before they truly started, and to ferry the injured out to the city when the winding roads would take too long to traverse. But, once the town of Stonebridge was established in a wide, deep valley with its beating heart, Stonebridge College, built against the mountain face, even more air traffic began to frequent the area. No one was quite sure why, but no one in their right mind would question the influx of money coming into the area via the college. So, even the most hardened old-timers would just shrug their shoulders and ignore any of the noise coming from above. Deep in the Catskills, Stonebridge College was the crowning jewel of what was now one of the larger towns in the rural mountains. Everything revolved around the school. As the name suggested, there were only two ways into Stonebridge. Beneath the naturally occurring rock bridge that spanned two smaller mountains, under which a small highway had been built, or through the long, dark maintenance tunnel that led straight through the side of the mountains themselves. It looked wildly out of place, Delacroix thought, as the chopper started the wide circle that foreshadowed the landing. Stonebridge College was all sleek metal and modern architecture, and it wore the veneer of a newer college campus well. But to someone like Delacroix, who had seen the depths of the deception that Umbral Group could pull off, it was obvious that the entire thing was a front for something more nefarious. Wind from the blade buffeted all of them as he spoke, settling fully into his second identity as Sentinel. His voice sounded foreign and tiny over the headsets they all wore. The objective is complete and total destruction, he told them. A biological weapon of some sort has leaked and is infecting students, and we need to clean up the mess before it spills over into the general public. They're calling it the Havoc Virus. This is what we were vaccinated for before leaving. We aren't privy to the information of how the virus is spread, but it's almost safe to assume that it's virulent. Keep your nose and mouth covered at all times if possible, and let's do our damnedest not to get any bodily fluids on us. Aegis adds. Or in our mouths. Jester adds sagely, eliciting a groan from the rest of the group. We need to be in and out as quickly as we possibly can but at the same time leave no trace behind. None of this can be tracked back to Umbral. Since we're pretty confident that there is a significant student population uninfected, we also need to do this without being seen, if at all possible. Thorough and silent is the name of the game today. Understood? Yes, sir. Six voices echoed back to him, and he nodded. Good. We'll be dropped right outside of town and enter in with local law enforcement. Stonebridge is currently under martial law and communication blackout. Unsurprisingly, Umbral has already paid off the city cops to let us blend in until we're inside the campus. The whole town is crawling with federal officers and teams, but we're banking on the fact that they don't know enough about the Havoc virus to risk entering the campus themselves yet. Heads low until we're inside, understood? Another round of agreements. The team all unstrapped from their seats and finished final preparations for departure. There wasn't a lot of chatter between them, every member familiar with their roles, but it was the comfortable, functional silence of a capable group. The sort of silence that was full of wordless communication, a touch on the shoulder here, and a head jerk there. Ares spoke, but so much of the time, they spoke their own language. The chopper shuddered as it touched down on the packed dirt of the field where other helicopters and small fixed winged aircraft had been landing since the outbreak first began. In a dark olive green, the Umbral Group's vehicles were unmarked and went unnoticed for the most part among dozens of other similarly colored vehicles, and the same idea was applied to Ares themselves. What wasn't readily apparent, though, was that everything they carried, as well as everything they wore, was top-of-the-line, experimental equipment, 
not available to any public entities, and produced directly by the Umbral Group. The team was in black on black, pulling on the rest of their protective gear as they exited the chopper, pulling up black fabric face covers from inside the collars of their shirts that left only their eyes visible. Anonymity was paramount, but they wouldn't need the heavier masks until they were further into campus. Ares moved like seven limbs of a single animal, even having a hard time giving up the habit when Sentinel hissed at them to ease up so they could integrate better. The Stonebridge local police captain had the decency to look sheepish about agreeing to a bribe so easily, but no one could fault him for being punctual. He and a few of his officers were waiting for Ares as soon as their helicopter departed, discreetly palming a badge with Stonebridge PD insignia on it when he shook each of their hands. Little did the man know their entire town was more than likely bankrolled by the Umbral Group, so he'd more or less been living off of dirty money for ages anyway. The thick forest outside the natural stone archway entrance to the town had become more or less a central base for all of the different departments working on the Havoc outbreak. So, when the Stonebridge captain, who introduced himself as Greg, motioned for the Ares team to follow him, they made sure to keep their heads down as they did so. So, you're like what? Hired guns? Greg asked quietly, his thumbs hooked into his Kevlar vest. Raptor sneered under his mask, hissing. I know good and well. You were told not to ask questions, so why don't you keep it that way? Yeah, well, the police captain shrugged one shoulder, his body language stuffed and annoyed. This is just such a quiet little town besides the occasional overblown party at the college. So, you know, having all this go down has got us all a little shaken up. But even more than that, curious. This kind of stuff just doesn't happen around here. Jester's snort was audible. <laughs> Whatever you gotta tell yourself, buddy. The police captain opened his mouth to retort, but Sentinel spoke first. Enough. Our intel says that there's a maintenance tunnel we can use to enter the campus, right? You were paid good money to make sure that its existence isn't public knowledge. Is that still the case? Yeah. We covered it up well enough. It's only big enough for a single vehicle. We're going on foot, Sentinel told him. He motioned Hawkeye forward who shouldered his arm sniper rifle and joined his commander at the front of the moving unit of officers and Ares team members. Hawkeye here will be posted at a high point to be decided once we get to the tunnel, and while it's unlikely that he will be seen, if that happens you're going to have to claim him as one of your squad so he isn't bothered. Got it? Greg clearly wants to complain, but Jester rubs his thumb and forefingers together in the universal sign for money where the police captain can see it and the man sighs. Fine. We'll make it work. Outside of Stonebridge, the forest surrounding everything was so green and suffocating that it would have been a nightmare as far as visuals were concerned. But, once they crossed the threshold into the town itself, they all breathed a sigh of relief. Stonebridge really was a microcosm of a city, the residential areas on the edges of the town spiraling inwards and becoming businesses and government office buildings. With the mountains and the thick emerald woods holding the valley and town like a cupped palm, it was easy to see why Umbral would choose a place like this for clandestine lab work. Under the guise of Stonebridge College, no one would be the wiser. Tucked up against a rock face at the back of town, the college would have been something to be proud of under normal circumstances. Now, though, it seemed to loom over Stonebridge, a blister ready to burst. Greg had Ares loaded into an armored vehicle once they made it to the police station, but not before they were able to get a good look at the state of the town and how present the military really was. There was a fog of uncertainty and fear hanging over Stonebridge, the streets mostly empty of civilians, but small groups of soldiers posted on every corner and walking in formation down the sidewalks, rifles in hand. Those residents that braved the outdoors all looked pale and drawn, their eyes dark and wide with nervous caution. It was eerily silent, 
only the sounds of boots on the concrete and the clacking of gear and weapons knocking together, echoing off the brick buildings. Umbral had done a decent job of building a place that mirrored the other, much older Appalachian towns. But with all the life drained out of the place, it was readily apparent how fake it all was. Like a movie set, or an art piece done in miniature and left to collect dust somewhere. Seeing all the soldiers clad with the newest of everything, technology blinking and humming on their bodies and in their hands, just made the scene even more bizarre. Yeah, so, this place gives me the creeps, Tempest said to Cypher next to her, pulling her face covered down enough that he could hear her whisper. They all look like they're under some sort of mind control or something. That would be a more impactful observation, if it wasn't entirely possible. Cypher answered, not bothering to look up from the wrist in her face he was making adjustments on. I hate talking to you sometimes, Tempest sighed, covering her face once more. How has the public reacted to the blackout and martial law? Sentinel asked Greg, once they were on the road, the inside of the armored vehicle almost as quiet as the oddly empty town outside. Uh, they're terrified right now, but biological scares tend to do that to civilians. We've got precious few days before they start getting restless, but for the moment they're all pretty content to stay inside. Aegis exhaled slowly. This needs to be resolved before outside relatives and acquaintances start to wonder why they can't contact their loved ones and begin arriving. Only having one entrance to town is helpful, bottleneck. But large groups of distraught individuals will end up being a powder keg of problems if you all aren't careful. <laughs> you talk like you won't be right here helping us, Greg laughed. But the sound died off when he realized that no one else agreed with his assessment. We don't do that, Raptor informed him. You won't see us again after this. And you do well to just take your check and shut up once we're in the tunnel. Greg had been captain for years at this point. And while he had been the top dog for so long among his own police force, he suddenly felt like a rookie again, among all these government and, more mysterious, soldiers. There was no way he'd pass up a payday like the one he had been offered by someone that had only identified themselves as a board member of the college. But something about the team he was escorting made the acid in his gut churn. Them along with the change that this town has undergone in such a swift amount of time, made him feel the same sort of uneasiness as a discordant piece of music. It went under his skin, raising goosebumps and making him feel vaguely ill. Something was off, but he was powerless to do anything about it. No amount of zeros in his bank account was going to make him feel any better about the situation. But... They were either hours or days away from death rolling through the streets on viral wings. So he simply kept his head down and got the Ares team to the maintenance tunnel entrance. It was all he could do. Covered with various diatrists like broken pallets and discarded office equipment, the entrance to the maintenance tunnel had been hidden surprisingly well by Stonebridge officers and they did an equally effective job of clearing the debris out of the way, while Sentinel went over the next steps of their mission with his team. Everything was about timing. If they lingered too long, then they ran the risk of the military making it into the campus before they could complete their objective. But if they rushed, something might be missed. They were all cool and collected, but it didn't escape the commander that biological contagions weren't nearly as commonplace for them as other, more visible threats. Donning full face masks complete with respirators, they became anonymous. Faceless and all dressed identically, they moved like phantoms down the dark tunnel once open. Sentinel leading the forward group while Raptor took the rest to watch the rear as they made their way into the campus. They all wore headlamps that bobbed with their steps, and for a time it was so lightless that time seemed to move strangely around them. Viscous. But after a little less than an hour, the path curved right, and they saw the bright white rectangle of the open tunnel exit. Open, Sentinel thought, cursing to himself. It meant that someone had at least tried to use the maintenance tunnel to escape the campus. 
He had nothing to make him think that they had succeeded, but it did mean that whoever it was might return to try again. Once they were inside of the quarantined campus, it was immediately apparent that everything was wrong. Disturbing and wrong. He held a single finger in front of his mouth, before using two to point to Hawkeye, indicating for him to go. The sniper nodded once in the affirmative and disappeared up the embankment to the left. There was a single tall clock tower in the center of the campus that would be the best lookout point for him, but there was no time to waste taking the entire team to escort Hawkeye there when he could hold his own well enough. A 12-foot tall, expandable metal wall had been erected at the entrance of the campus to maintain the quarantine, meaning that Ares, for the most part, was safe from being seen by anyone but the poor souls inside the campus. But they couldn't be too careful. Too Aegis, it all looked like she had expected, but she was still more on edge than usual. Something in the most primitive part of her brain was sending off warning signals, and she couldn't figure out what it was until they made it out from behind the nondescript office building that the maintenance tunnel had led to, and out into the campus proper. There, small clusters of people, ranging from two to around six individuals, hovered restlessly in corners and pressed up against walls like they were hiding from something. With unblinking, pinpoint pupiled eyes, arms limp at their sides and mouths that hung open to display blackened gums and tongues, Aegis' brain saw corpses before anything else. But they stood, and they moved, and that's what was making that ancient survival urge inside of her rear its inconvenient head. The ones that still had some pink in their flesh would jerk forward every few minutes, hacking a wet, rattling, agonal cough before straightening again. But the grayer ones were as silent as the grave. So avoiding the light, she said as quietly as possible, with just enough volume to be picked up by the comms in each of their helmets. Avoid dark places, especially on your own. Do you copy that, Hawkeye? Copy, he murmured from somewhere else on the campus. Unlike the town itself, Stonebridge College didn't try to appear quaint or vintage in any way. Everything from the dormitories to the lecture halls were all angular and gleamingly new. The Umbral Group spared no expense when it came to their little cover-up project. And because of that fact, the laboratories where the research on the Havoc virus had been conducted blended in seamlessly to everything else. It also meant that the place was still full of civilian students, some of them now the shambling infected, but others hanging out their dorm windows, haggard and exhausted, begging the passing Ares soldiers for help when they were spotted. Sheets hung from balconies, pleas for salvation written on them. None of them bothered Cypher much. It was just work, no different than any other assignment, but the one sheet with the words Mom, it's Cassie. I'm still alive. Made him swallow hard. Jesus. He whispered, more to himself than anything. But Tempest replied, I don't think he's here today. Moving in two parallel lines, Ares kept to the light, the location of the lab that was their destination flashing on each of their wrist interfaces. But the sheer number of infected students made it impossible for them to avoid confrontation forever. In the center of the street, a group of three huddled in the shadow of a delivery truck that had been abandoned, swaying and brushing against each other like blades of dry grass. No one was sure what their trigger was, or how far the infected could see. But once Ares was twelve feet away, the first of them reacted. It was just the turn of a head, but it was enough. Steady, Raptor told them over the comms. The group of three moved as one, but whatever thread that connected their broken minds was nothing compared to the soldiers. It was a small enough threat that they were able to neutralize it in seconds. Three perfectly aimed bullets between three sets of eyes. But it was the first indication of just how violent the infected would prove to be. It didn't matter what virus was boiling beneath their skin though. Dead on the ground, still and silent, 
the infected still were college kids, and even the Ares soldiers were human enough to be bothered. Any reaction was hidden by the masks. All demons kept personal when there was a job to be done. So, like the tide, the team swept through the campus, quiet and unstoppable. Killing the infected was not part of their objective. That sort of dirty work would be left to the military once Umbral's team was long gone. Ideally, Ares could have made it to the lab without any other altercations, but there was a reason Umbral sent a combat-tested team. At the end of the day, the Havoc virus was meant to weaponize the unfortunate souls it infected, and while it wasn't completed by the time it leaked out of the lab and onto the campus, the virus still did its job well enough. It never became bad enough to cause any sort of commotion that would be noticed by the military stationed outside the quarantine wall, but each member had to raise the rifle at least once, pull the trigger, and take out what was undeniably an innocent person whose body and mind had been turned against them by something microscopic and lethal. They still bled red, too. Every Ares member saw it but it bothered Aegis most. Breathing through clenched teeth, she didn't turn her head when Sentinel fell back a few paces next to her. With comms off, just person to person, he asked. You doing all right, kid? Fine, she gritted out, hoping he couldn't hear the way her stomach acid was burning in her throat. No one would fault you for not taking the kill shots in this case, Alvarez. The pressure isn't that high. She shook her head. I do what is expected of all of us, and I will continue to do so. Hmm. Understood. He turned his masked face to her, looking down as they walked. Aegis wished she could take him up on the offer, but medic or no, she could and would continue to do her job. The comms clicked to life. I'm in position on the clock tower. Acknowledged, Hawkeye, Sentinel answered. We're less than a mile from the lab now. Do you have visual? Yes. Head left, between the two brick buildings. And there is a courtyard there that can be followed all the way back to the entrance of the lab. If you go that direction, you'll avoid any more infection clusters until you're at the lab itself, where a lot of them are congregating. No surprise there, Agus said tightly. That's probably the initial infection pocket. Jester hums in thought. They seem to be taking mostly visual cues, but I can set off a distraction so we can make better time. Do it. Rejoin the group ASAP once you're finished, Sentinel told the corporal. Hawkeye, cover him and whatever infected don't leave the back lab entrance, I want you to eliminate so we aren't wasting any more time taking them out ourselves. The sniper grunted in the affirmative. Great. Let's move. Jester peeled off to the right, while the rest of Ares went left, heading to the mid-campus courtyard and forward until the long, L-shaped laboratory, drab gray and unassuming, was visible in the distance. Sentinel holds his fist up in the air in front of him to stop their advance, speaking over the comms. Jester, if you're in position, go ahead. Acknowledged. Detonation in three, two, and one. From where they stood, the boom was sharp and crackling, like a handful of powerful fireworks, or a live wire hitting the ground. Loud enough to get anyone's attention on campus, but not so obvious that any of the government officials outside the walls couldn't write it off as some side effect of whatever chaos they were picturing going on inside. From his vantage point, Hawkeye told them the reaction from the infected. A good amount of them pivoted, rushing from the safety of the dark overhang of the two lab entrances and towards the explosion. But there were still some stragglers. He couldn't be sure, he told them, but it looked to Hawkeye like the ones that didn't move were those that were the most, or longest, infected. The virus was killing them slowly, rage driving them to attack all the way until the fever burned all the synapses in their brains out. For those infected... There was no sight or sound left to them, but the still rage drove them, on and on. 
Jester rejoined them right as they made it to within sightline of the remaining infected. When the first one moved, just a twitch of the hand, Hawkeye began his near-silent assault. Aegis counted ten infected, most of them wearing white lab coats, some stained in blood, and watched wordlessly as Hawkeye dropped them, one after the other, with a flawless shot. The muted pop of his silenced rifle couldn't be heard from where the rest of the team was, still advancing as their sharpshooter cleared their path, but the dull thunk of the bodies hitting the ground made up for it. They stepped over the downed infected, Jester taking point and wrapping a long line of detonation cord around the barricaded door, blasting it open in a puff of smoke and ember. And then it was Sentinel and Raptor clearing the desks and chairs out of the doorway that whatever uninfected people inside had used to try and keep their virus-laden co-workers out. Tempest blazed with adrenaline, watching it all, a deadly, graceful dance that she could never get enough of. Each member knew what was needed of them without a single word exchanged. It was exquisite. She burned for her turn to shine. It came as they cleared the rooms, two by two. Sentinel and Aegis, Raptor and Jester, and Cypher and Tempest. She didn't mind getting stuck with the dweeb who, of course, was an excellent warrior just like any other soldier working under the Eclipse Initiative, but she had to poke fun where she could. Watching Cypher work often left her feeling out of her depth, the way his human mind seemed to meld with whatever technology he needed to coerce and slowly break into pieces. So, when they entered the empty appearing office and an infected lunged at her partner with stunning speed, she took them down with her own two hands before Cypher could even breathe. Her knee on the throat of the havoc-riddled scientist, she pulled out her sidearm and sunk a shot between the eyes their whites red with burst capillaries. Cypher gave her a nod of thanks. Under the mask, Tempest beamed. Trouble was kept to a minimum, business as usual, until they made it to the back of the building where the student lab was. An open floor plan with stations spread out for students to learn while working. It was, by all appearances, the last room in the building, Two swinging doors separated the lab from the Ares team. There has to be more than this last room, Sentinel mused. Cypher, see if you can get us any intel once we get inside, okay? If there is more to this place, it has to be connected to this last room. Sentinel and Raptor each pushed a door open. No one was surprised to see another cluster of three infected inside. What gave them pause, though was the way they were grouped together in front of a clear decontamination shower stall, where two women were crammed inside. Two uninfected women. The younger of the two, clearly a student, knelt on the ground with her head in her hands. Standing, with some tiny pistol in her hands, was an older woman, a professor more than likely. She was heavily pregnant and staring at the team with wide eyes. Quiet. She mouthed. Ares was decidedly not quiet. It was another split-second decision. Saving any uninfected civilians was not on the agenda for the day. Too much time, and too much attention drawn to them. They weren't heroes, but even Umbral's hired hands weren't monsters. Tempest and Raptor took the shots, and as soon as the infected were on the ground, Sentinel and Jester pulled the bodies aside while Aegis helped the woman out of the decontamination pod. They were shaking and exhausted, but after a quick once-over by the medic, who applied her most soothing voice to the terrified survivors, they were deemed healthy enough to flee. Take us with you, the pregnant woman begged, but it fell on deaf ears. Once she realized that the masked, faceless team wasn't going to assist them any further, she took the student by the hand and led her out. Head for the dorms, Raptor told them. While Cypher and the rest of the group went to find a working computer terminal, Sentinel hung back long enough to ping Hawkeye on a private channel and tell him as quietly as possible. Two girls on the way out. Permission granted to offer them covering fire if you deem it necessary. Keep this between you and me, Cormac. The sharpshooter chuckled. 
Roger that, boss. Nothing could stand in Cypher's way when it came to any sort of security network, but with the lab owned by the Umbral Group and Cypher being employed by Umbral, it took him mere seconds to have the four plan uploaded to his interface and then sent to the rest of the team for reference. They really were in the last room of the first floor, but the surprise was the entire underground laboratory there on the floor schematics and the entrance to the stairs to said lab appearing as nothing but a flat, featureless wall. Me again? Jester suggested, but Cypher disagreed. No, I've got this one. With a little more time at the terminal, Cypher had it, and the rest of the team shouldered their rifles and watched the rookie approach the blank wall, hold his wrist interface to it in one certain spot, and a green keypad glowed to life on the wall face. He keyed in the code, and the wall opened like a sliding door, revealing a staircase lit by fluorescent lighting. Descending to the underground lab, the secret space was identical in size to the upper lab, but where one had been purely and obviously for education, the lower one was not. The research stations in the secret lab were piled with papers, filing cabinets dotting the walls, on the other side of the room were lines of what looked like hospital beds, patient restraints hanging loose on each one, with an extensive medical lab occupying one corner, full of vials of unknown liquids and the sharp scent of disinfectant. Finally, there was the room built into the corner, completely windowless and shut behind a solid metal door. Inside, there was the dry, rasping sound of leaves crunching underneath walking feet, hushed, and ominous. This was all of it. Everything that the Umbral Group wanted destroyed. This was ground zero of the Havoc virus. For the love of all that is holy, do not take your masks off. Aegis reminds them, as if any of them would ever dream of it. She lingered near the only occupied bed, the corpse locked in restraints, freshly dead. His name tag, which read Mark, made him seem more real than the rest she had killed that day, even though his blood wasn't on her hands. Had Ares looked through the stacks of papers and overflowing filing cabinets, they would have found the horror that was written into the very atoms of the Havoc virus. Maybe they would have seen the sheer amount of people sacrificed to test it. Or... Maybe they would have discovered how easily such a thing could be used to bring the world to its knees, if ever fully completed. But they didn't. Ares never looked, or investigated. And if any of them ever wondered, they kept it to themselves. Rifles were shouldered, and the small electricity-powered flamethrowers came out. They began working on burning it all to the ground. Scorched earth, and nothing less. Cypher went through and meticulously wiped any mention of Havoc, the Eclipse Initiative, and most importantly, the Umbral Group from every computer terminal in the place, giving a silent prayer of thanks that they hadn't incorporated their new AI into the workings at the lab yet. He also injected false information which would lead any outside investigators to assume the research was done at the behest of the researchers here and by them alone. He would question himself the entire helicopter ride back about what happened next, but when he found the code to open the windowless room, it was Sentinel that gave him the go-ahead to use it. No stone left unturned, after all. The room's door shushed open and the dry grating sound became so loud that it was close to unbearable. The source of the cacophony was over a dozen infected, the oldest they had encountered yet, pouring out of the room into the lab, brittle, but still consumed by havoc, and therefore by rage. Each wore one of those hospital bracelets, white, with the word SUBJECT written on them in red capital letters. SHIT was all Raptor got out before the infected were on. The nearest of them, Tempest, small and devastating, still wasn't prepared for the immediate onslaught. 
but her pride in a simmering bloodlust that only came over her when she was backed into a seemingly impossible situation wouldn't allow her to fall away. Her left hand went to her side and came back up with a combat knife in an ice pick grip, her right hand snapping out like the strike of a cobra. Had she been more experienced, the thought may have made it into her head that these enemies weren't going to recoil or stumble away, though. These infected were horrifying, desiccated shells of people, their lips so dried up and curled back that the blackened cavern of their mouths and stark white teeth made them look more skeletal than anything that was recently living. So, when her blade or her fist hit home, only the kinetic force of it moved them. They were past pain, and maybe had been for months, even years at that point. Damn it, Tempest, get back, Raptor told her, clenching his teeth as he and the rest of the team had to take their shots as carefully as possible to avoid the rookie's unpredictable movements in the fray. She hesitated, and then obeyed, but the horde was thick and numerous, so that each backward step she took had her up against another havoc-infected body. Two limbs short now, Hawkeye in his nest outside, and Tempest in the eye of the storm, the creature that was Ares was not made any less effective. It took one minute and 37 seconds to resolve the problem. Jester and Aegis flanked the group of infected, each on one side, popping shots into the brains of the other ones far enough away from their team member that there was no chance of a stray bullet hitting the rookie. Meanwhile, Cypher entered the command to close the cell door once more, and it whooshed shut, catching the outstretched arms of one infected still trying to get out, severing them while trapping at least four others inside. At the front, Raptor continued with covering fire, while Sentinel gave the only other verbal command during the skirmish. Tempest, on the ground, now. Trained to obey her commander's orders with as much speed as her own thoughts, Tempest dropped. She heard the muted, chemical huff of a flamethrower being primed, and then the wave of heat above her, shimmering in the air as the orange flames licked at the bodies of the test subjects, and they went up in conflagration like so much kindling. With eyes like wilted raisins in the sockets and the skin of an unwrapped mummy, the test subjects hit the tiled floor and all but crumbled, ash and a collection of bones. They did not scream, but those that didn't burn still bled red. Then it was done, Tempest rising to her feet, more than a little embarrassed at having to be saved, but infinitely glad her mask covered the flush of her cheeks. It was the first real challenge of the day, and they were all more than anxious to be on their way. Pools of infected blood at their feet made them even more eager to burn it all to ashes until there wasn't a single shred of anything that could link Havoc back to the Umbral group. It was done, with not a second to spare. Hawkeye's voice was so sudden in all of their ears that a few of them jumped when he spoke up. We need to move. I don't know how they managed it, but the containment wall at the front campus entrance has been breached, and the infected are bleeding out into the town. Fuck. Sentinel muttered. Go ahead and call in the extraction and meet us at the parking lot in front of the maintenance tunnel. Let us know if you need any assistance. Acknowledged. Ares doesn't flee, but their escape from the quarantined campus of Stonebridge College moved much faster than their entrance. The need for stealth lessened now that the infected had already breached containment. They moved swiftly and quietly avoiding the infected as much as possible, and watching as the roofs of the occupied dorms started to fill with students, watching the chaos of the town outside the college boundaries begin to succumb. They don't stop. Not once. Not even to look at the surviving students who begged for someone, anyone to help them. There was no time. The military would be inside Stonebridge College any minute, and Ares needed to be long gone before then. Hawkeye seamlessly rejoins their ranks as the maintenance tunnel they used to enter the campus comes into view, but Sentinel holds up his fist to bring them all to a stop as they watch what had caught his attention. 
A small group of surviving students was moving, crouched low to the ground and armed with a mixture of firearms and melee weapons, escaped into the maintenance tunnel and deep into the mountain, the same way that Ares had entered. Sentinel closed his eyes, annoyed at the obstacle, but unwilling to stop or even eliminate the students just to add a few extra minutes to their escape time. His job was done for the day. There was no harm in letting a few others take their best chance at survival. Let them go, he says. As soon as they take the turn in the tunnel, we'll go behind them. Let's move. Ares kept their distance from the second group, giving them their space. But once the college students were far enough ahead, they resumed their previous pace, rushing to get out of the tunnel and into the extraction chopper that must already be circling the town, waiting for them to emerge. It was another long, hot jog, made more frustrating by the necessary pauses to let the students keep ahead of them. But they eventually saw the light indicating that freedom wasn't far. It was no breath of fresh air when they came out of the darkness and into the sunshine. Stonebridge had dissolved into chaos, the various groups of military soldiers barely able to keep the infected at bay while also dealing with the outright panic of the uninfected civilians. For the first time that day, Ares watched as the infected were able to carry out the full expanse of their fury on another human, attacking them with teeth and nails like an animal, only torn off their victims by huge barrages of bullets by the government soldiers. Where Ares took the infected down with a single shot on the campus grounds, the unprepared military soldiers peppered them with shots, five, even ten times until the kill shot landed and they could move on to the next. Let's get the hell out of here, Raptor grated out, rattled by the scene that unfolded before them. Madness reigned all around as the team ran for the helicopter, which refused to land amidst the commotion, dropping a ladder for Ares while staying high enough in the air that no infected or desperate civilian could force their way on board. One after the other, the team climbed up and in, with Sentinel going last. When he hauled his huge frame into the bird, he got one last look at the ground below and saw the familiar faces of the student group pushing through the crowd in a battered SUV, and he smirked. Internally, he wished the crafty group well before turning to his own team, their faces still covered with their respirator masks that they would wear until fully decontaminated. Air tasted stale in his mouth, and he couldn't wait to be out of the damned thing. Hell of a job, Sentinel told them gruffly, strapping into his seat. We might as well go over the mission in hindsight, since we've got some time on our hands. There were a few groans, but he ignored them. Really, he didn't mind the occasional pushback. It meant they were all still in good enough spirits, and most importantly, it meant he had brought them out alive. After a decontamination so thorough that a few members of the Ares team would claim their fingerprints had been scalded off, they were debriefed. Body cam footage looked over to guarantee that all traces of the Umbral group had been wiped clean from Stonebridge College. Aegis bit her tongue when it became clear Umbral didn't care if Havoc ran rampant, as long as their name wasn't attached. But the others found a sense of pride in the completion of the project. They were loyal for the time being and they remained a very, very effective tool for Umbral. Invaluable, even. The Havoc virus continued to spread, but as the weeks passed, Stonebridge and two neighboring cities disappeared from any available digital or physical map of the Catskills. From above, death rained down in a dense, gray-green fog, and then the soon-forgotten towns were cleansed by fire. Once they burned down to ash, they were no more. After the ashes were raked over, no further infections were reported. Ares rested, awaiting their next assignment. They washed their hands, but sometimes, each one of them dreamt that the water ran red. <laughs>